Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Grad webinar, Going Beyond Climate Biodiversity in Focus. This is a part of Grasp Inside ESG series, where, it's, where, the, where together with industry experts, we explore sustainability topics relevant for the real assets community. My name is Antonina Ivanova. I am Associated Grasp infrastructure and I will be joined today by GRASP Foundation and GRASP members to talk about biodiversity. Uh, as an industry-driven organization, we've observed the market changes and demand uh, from the GRASP and Western members and participants to go beyond climate considerations when speaking about investments in the real assets. Therefore, this year, biodiversity topic has been prioritized by the GRASP Foundation and it is now in our 2024 roadmap. Uh, we can also see that dedicated disclosure requirements and reporting standards are already taking shape. For example, release of the TNFD guidance and uh, EU including biodiversity disclosures in the ESRS standards. Not to mention the wider context of regional regulations that will in the long term uh, impl have implications on the industry as well. Uh, that's why we're here today to speak about uh, biodiversity with Grab Foundation and Grasp members to see how uh, the industry is navigating this landscape in their daily operations. Just before we start, a uh, couple of words about housekeeping. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen. Uh, we will address them at the end of the session uh, during Q&A. An email with the on-demand link will be shared with everybody after the session. And of course, you can always reach us uh, uh, at infogress.com. Uh, now that we covered the logistics, let me introduce Sarah Welton, who will be hosting today's conversation. Uh, Sarah is the director of Cresp Foundation, the nonprofit organization charged with owning and evolving the Cresp standards. Biodiversity is a key consideration for them as they grapple with providing the industry with the most useful decision, useful data to help them manage uh, the real assets. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Antonina. I appreciate it. Um, well, we're really excited to be here, and I brought some own, my own biodiversity with me um, to really be uh, on point. Uh, I am joined by two very esteemed GRESB leaders in the market, so I'm really excited to welcome Hink and Lee and Lizzie Leon. Uh, Lizzie is the America's head for ESG, investing with Goldman Sachs Asset Management, where she helps define the global ESG strategy. She sets in place frameworks and oversees implementation. Lizzie has uh, joined Goldman in 2021 and has more than 14 years of experience in, the, in ESG in the built environment. Welcome, Lizzie. Uh, Hinken uh, Lee is the chair of the Natural Capital Steering Committee for Next Energy Group and represents Solar Energy UK as the chair of the Natural Capital Steering Group. With over 20 years of experience in the environmental sector, Lee is a chartered environmentalist and a member of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. Uh, welcome, Hinken. It's lovely to have you. Um, I'm going to kick off with you with the first question. This came up during our pre in our pre discussion. Help us understand the distinction between biodiversity and nature and also speak to Next Energy Capital's uh, investment and asset management strategy, please. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me to this platform to talk about my favorite topic. Um, the question you pose, I think, is, is an important one. Um, and it's often the two terms, nature and biodiversity, is often used interchangeably. Um, so for me, there, there are lots of definitions on the internet and um, across the various platforms and frameworks, but nature to me is all encompassing um, and it's all encompassing of the natural world. So it goes beyond flora and fauna, um, but also includes, you know, the processes, the soil, air, water um, and the systems that forms our stocks of natural capital effectively and also the ecosystem services that, that flow from these stocks of natural capital. Um, whereas the term biodiversity for me um, really is simply the variety of 
uh, living organisms, the variety of life on Earth, and is, is mainly to describe the diversity of, of living organisms um, and the variability of these across ecosystems. And as I said, um, I think, you know, these terms are used interchangeably, but I feel they shouldn't be because conceptually in the industry, um, they can really change the level of focus for a particular scope of work. And for Next Energy Capital, um, you know, the, the term nature, I guess, in the ESG world is, is certainly gaining a lot of traction, um, particularly in our group, but in our sector um, across corporates, financials, public organisations as well, um, that we'll probably touch on later on in the webinar but really what we're trying to do as an organization as a financier and as an investor is to build on that momentum from climate change action um, and really start to integrate the nature systems and the ecosystem integrity aspects of 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 climate biodiversity and, and water stewardship um, and, and integrating nature into the investment world in context of our strategy um, and I think in context of a lot of the frameworks as well is about addressing the main drivers of, of nature loss. Um, and that's identified by the um, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform, um, platform of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, also known as IPBES. Um, and IPBES are to nature as I guess IPCC are to, to climate, right? The, the scientists behind the, the trends. And um, it best identify these direct drivers of nature losses, um, conversion of land, so changing of sea and land use, um, direct exploitation of organisms, climate change, pollution and invasive um, species, so non-native species. And it's important there because obviously climate change is um, a driver of nature loss. So we start to use nature as, a, as an all-encompassing term that includes our climate aspects as well. Um, before I close on this question, the I guess the, the, the two lesser well-known indirect drivers um, are in terms of nature loss are to do with people's disconnect with nature and the resulting, I guess, lack of value placed on the importance of nature. And, and that's inherent to the natural capital concept because ultimately, you know, we have historically undervalued nature and that is why we are on that downward trajectory of, of nature loss and that is why we are exploiting it at a rate that you know we need to basically reverse that downward trend right i mean i can tell you sitting in nature yes we have lost sort of an appreciation and that tragedy of the commons is uh in in full effect um lizzie i know you're focused on u.s real estate so i'd be curious to hear uh, Goldman's strategy around your investments? Um, and do you think it's possible, this is actually a, a question we, we received pre-submitted um, from the audience. Is it, and it's a big one, is it possible for the real estate industry to converge around a clear and simple goal on biodiversity the same way we've done with net zero um, carbon emissions? <clears throat> is this kind of being too basic and oversimplification? Or do you think that's uh, an ambitious task that we should we should try to take on? I, I I think that having that goal will happen eventually, but I think it will take some time. I think of biodiversity being kind of where carbon was about ten years ago, and that what that really means is that we're going to see a lot of change in this space. I think there's a lot of things driving that change. We've got increasing regulation, which will increase transparency start to get people collecting the same metrics, collecting the same data, reporting in the same way. Uh, I think, you know, you know, the Hinken business and you know, other groups looking at where you're looking at investment, I think it will make it a lot clearer what you're investing in when you're investing in a nature-based solution. Um, but I also think that there's just a high level of education. So I think if we think about what went into the kind of evolution of the past 15 years of this coalescence, industry coalescence around the net zero goal for carbon, it's, do we have clear asset standards? Do we have a clear way to calculate a portfolio impact? Um, and then, you know, are there kind of benchmarking tools? And I think what we're seeing, you know, we're seeing some science-based nature targets and we're seeing nature positive and we're seeing TNFD metrics. 
But I think a lot of these are in their kind of first iteration. And I think over the next few years, we're going to see this change a lot. Um, so from our business, you know, our goal really is to make sure we have a kind of continued focus on implementation and impact uh, at our asset level, um, and then be flexible uh, with how we're collecting data, how we're reporting, because I think we, we know that those are going to change and evolve over the coming years. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. Um, I think to build on that, Sarah, um, uh, everything Lizzie says is, is absolutely correct. And, and I think the underpinning thing about nature is that it's not fungible. Um, it's location specific. So everyone is searching for that, you know, that benchmark, that single metric, that measurement. And it doesn't necessarily exist because things mean different, you know, ha has different values in, in different locations. And it's not until a business or, a, or an investor really understands how they interact with nature um, mm -hmm. until then they can actually proactively manage those those associated risks. And I think by identifying those and addressing those risks, you you know, you start to not only safeguard your operations, but you also start unlocking these opportunities for um, for for growth as well. And and I think just to um, think about that benchmarking aspect is is really the process, right? So World Benchmarking Alliance really highlights an alarming reality that um, that only one percent of companies really truly understand to what extent their operations depend on nature. And I think you know, the more we can benchmark companies against how far they understand their interface across their upstream and direct operations, then that is more the kind of comparable aspect. I, I know it's not a metric, but it's more where is the business in relation to that process of understanding. Not a metric, but a process, because to your point, I mean, sitting in the United States, and I'm, I'm sure this is no surprise to either of y'all, water is a different resource in different parts of the country. It is prevalent in some places and it is scarce in others. So it's our relationship to that resource is, is very different depending on where you are. Going um, <clears throat> to that point, how, how do you currently, or how do you think we should be or will be quantitatively valuing biodiversity and nature for that matter. Um, I know both of your organizations have, have published a lot, but I don't know if there's, um, you know, some ideas that you have on, you know, on these two topics, because, and I know this is a, this is a big question, the sort of put, put a price on, put a price on nature, put a price on biodiversity. It's like, oh, well, again, it depends on where you are, it depends on what your business is, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think that I'll just respond rather than as it relates to Goldman Sachs, but more as our kind of real estate business, I think, or our alternatives business. I think there's a few things that we're tracking. And I, I think this is more, there's a difference, right, between measuring metrics around nature and biodiversity versus what you're also talking about, which is like value, right? How do we put a, a dollar value? And I think that's slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, and I think especially if you start to talk about like valuation impacts on real estate, I don't think we're there yet. Right. Um, but I think if we want to talk about kind of metrics or so standardization around impact, you know, obviously with a lot of regulation, you know, TNFD, CSRD, those metrics are definitely front and center. And then we're obviously tracking things like finance biodiversity or Nature Action 100 in terms of um, investor and kind of peer sentiment. Hank, anything to add? Yeah, so I mean, Next Energy Capital, we 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 invest in infra. So, in context of renewable utility scale solar, in terms of what we specialize in, um, our, so so we do have that, I guess, oversight in terms of um, let's say evaluating projects at an asset level. Um, we have the business units that have that kind of transparency and. and auditability across that whole asset life cycle from um, our development arm through to asset management as well. Um, and in terms of evaluating projects, our approach, um, contrary to, I guess, the title of this webinar about biodiversity is, is, is really whether that's due diligence or design is, is guided by nature strategy. Um, so just to be clear, um, Next Energy Capital, Next Energy Group have not necessarily um, published yet 
their nature strategy, but we've been working to a, to align and we've been working to understand our interface. Um, and with this strategy, really, what we're trying to do is align with all these recognized standards, frameworks, including the Paris Agreement, including GBF, TCFD, TNFD, SBTN, SBTI, GRI, all the acronyms, all the lovely acronyms that um, is within this ESG sector. Um, and what this alignment does is ensure that, you know, we have the consistency, the transparency and the accountability across our approach to nature. And going back to the fungibility aspect or the non-fungibility aspect of nature is that Obviously, we, we need that strategic approach to really identify what is material so we can then start prioritizing that meaningful action to reduce those drivers. And so the core approach for us as a business is aligning with TNFD, the LEAP approach, if you're familiar with it, and, and, and also SBTN in terms of the five-step approach to materiality, because what, what that does is that we then start forming goals and actions and KPIs um, to start making sure that our efforts are really driving those positive outcomes. And it's really the concept that we've been talking about, about, about double materiality, right? It's not just about the financial exposure, but it's also about that environmental impact that we have as well. And really importantly, it's about the direct operations as well as our upstream supply chains. Um, and, and, and fundamentally, it's about really understanding across all of the, the spectrum of direct operations, our full extent of our environmental footprint. And it's not until then you start forming kind of decision-making criteria to start reducing that footprint or reducing those drivers of nature loss. Um, but until you understand that, it's really hard to form an approach, right, at an asset level as well. Right. Yeah, we have to have the understanding first, because otherwise you're sort of shooting, you know, shooting in the dark. Um, <clears throat> speaking of not necessarily the drivers of nature loss, but the drivers of your business and the drivers toward uh, incorporating and evaluating biodiversity in nature, um, Lizzie, I'll turn to you. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, Goldman has published several reports and they highlight how protecting biodiversity will be essential to advancing the sustainable transformation of the global economy. And they call for significant increase in private sector investment. Um, as you think about your team's strategy, what are the primary considerations or concerns that you keep uh, top of mind? Uh, again, I'll bake in a, a pre-submitted question. What are, this, what are some of the best practices for a company interested in conducting a, a biodiversity impact analysis for the first time? What are, what are some lessons learned? What's, what's, what's going on in your brain as you uh, evaluate, reevaluate, and execute? I, I think um, the, the approach I generally take with our entire ESG program is you have to kind of dual track your high level materiality work with your kind of implementation work. Otherwise, you kind of stop implementing for two years before while you do your materiality. Um, so I think, you know, if we think about kind of the, the tangible day-to-day -day real estate drivers that we know can kind of have impact now, it's, you know, we, we have kind of that immediate focus on those as well, right? So that's things like we have a successful beekeeping program that our tenants seem to just love. And I know, and Sarah, you said you have some chapstick from them that you, you love. Um, they give kind of great products. Um, it's basic things like water waste efficiency or, you know, green, green cleaning, or, um, you know, we've started looking at like pollinator friendly landscaping. Um, and then at the same time, trying to kind of grow that understanding of like materiality. I think these are such a, a, a bigger scope of work. And especially for at an organization like Goldman, this doesn't happen just at the real estate level. It happens across our entire alternatives division. Um, so trying to understand the different businesses, the different value streams, trying to map that. Um, I think what I've heard some interesting anecdotes as well, that, that once you start looking at mapping your risk at your asset level, you start to understand maybe um, you can start to impact some things like insurance or your just general understanding of your resiliency. It starts to integrate back into your climate risk and resiliency. Um, so 
you know, definitely something that I think needs new kind of expertise. Uh, I'm not going to kind of give like recommendations here, providers, but having that kind of new expertise join uh, as a consultant internal uh, and kind of lead you through that, both the, starting with the materiality, understanding your kind of risk mapping, and then trying to get a sense of, of how you start to collect your, your reporting. But I think I really agree with that kind of Hinken that, that starting with those kind of TNFD metrics can really uh, can jumpstart you in your journey. Mm -hmm. um, Hinken, I can appreciate that on an infra scale, it's, it's a bit of a bigger picture as opposed to, you know, real estate. Um, can you talk about how you evaluate your projects and um, how does a reporting organization measure the impact it creates in altering local biodiversity um, due to its operations and sort of co-location within, you know, within nature? Um, are there, you know, getting back to those kind of metrics that, that you use, and I just will highlight Grez. Uh, Gresb uses habit loss, um, habitat loss, excuse me, as as an internalized metric. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your your evaluation, kind of what what's going on in your in your brain. We we have to, I think, we have to start moving away to begin with from um, asset level evaluation. I mean, asset level is is more dev and you know, in terms of assessment, making sure that what is appropriate, but but really we're talking about financial flows and decision making of financial flows, making sure that they're they're going into um, financing, you know, positive outcomes in climate and and nature. And I think and, and I think with climate, particularly with Next Energy Capital, um, not that we have an easy job, but you know, all of our funds are um, under the sustainable finance disclosure regulations as, as dark green and article nine. Um, and so we really need to start linking that climate aspect with with nature. We know mm -hmm. that they're, they're, they are absolutely interconnected. And, and I think our approach at the asset level feeds directly from the, the strategic level. I don't want to um, bang this drum again, but in terms of, um, let's say, our materiality, um, and I think SBTN is a really good example of a materiality approach that is obviously interoperable with TNFD. Um, but what SBTN looks at is um, upstream and direct operations. That upstream aspect of it um, starts to look at high impact commodities so it starts looking at um, what we call ISIC classifications it might become slightly technical but it's it's really to do with um, by volume and mass what are your material high impact commodities that you use across um, across your assets right so we take a base case and we start to draw a picture of okay well we um, need to know um, across steel, across certain other um, high impact commodities, we need to start tracing those back to um, tier one, to the mines effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and when we start to build that picture, what we can then start to do is build in controls in procurement contracts. We can start stewardship initiatives mm -hmm. to start reducing that kind of conversion upstream as well with our supply chain. Um, to, to ensure that they start aligning with SBTN. So one of the really good targets that is, is going to, I mean, they finished the piloting project on SBTN at the moment, but obviously no conversion of natural lands is really key, especially for um, a asset class such as utility scale solar, where you know land use and land conversion is quite material to us. And so as, as a target, we will commit to something like no conversion, which then implies lots of different things to do with supply chain for upstream. Um, but in terms of our direct operations, we start looking at restoration um, items yeah. and restoration initiatives as part of our portfolio, which is really exciting because it, it offers that strategic loop and closes that circle with regard to where does restoration sit within your investments? Where does restoration sit within the bigger picture? And then you can start using your materiality to start targeting where you've got sensitivities across your portfolio as well. 
So we start to think about meaningful impact when we start looking at it from a strategic level and then filtering down to the asset level. So um, not to do down the the beehives, you know, we, we, we love all of that stuff and not to do down the management plans because we, we do all of that stuff. Um, but it offers a, a bit more direction when, because what we're finding prior to disclosures under TNFD, we are an early adopter, we're going to disclose um, next year, but our say nature disclosure reports prior to having a materiality was, was effectively doing lots of different initiatives because we thought it, it was embedded in our mission. It was the right thing to do. And it's really hard then to show what the real impact of that is without that kind of strategic thinking. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, all good things to do and it's a yes and. Go ahead, Lizzie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, I just, I totally agree. I think you do all these small pieces knowing that there's some benefit, but I think that the conversation is changing so much and it's going to give us the framework and the tools to really say we have X impact. And right now, all these small things we do, they're just a list. They're just a checklist of things that you can do that you know have some value and part of your fiduciary duty, but they're not necessarily, um, I can't put out a metric saying we had X, Y, Z impact based on them. So. And not scalable. I mean, again, and it, it becomes these, and again, no no shade on random acts of sustainability, but it's not going to be what drives a market transformation. And right. and like I said, I love my, I love my, my B chapstick, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not going to change. It's not going to change the world for, for better or for worse. Um, we have a couple minutes left. And I mean, we have so much to talk about. So that just means that we'll have this conversation again. So there you go. Um, I'd like to bring back my colleague Antonina because I have I'm going to give <laughs> Lizzie and Hankin a, a small break. Um, as a reminder, you know, throw any questions you have in the chat. Anything we don't get to, we will we can send some follow up um, for, uh, via email. Um, but Antonina, I give me some context as it relates to to Grez. Uh, what is the adoption rate of the Americas region on biodiversity policy and action? And then, if you know, for companies based in the Americas, what are some policy examples in Europe, UK, and APAC uh, that can be used as as guideposts? Thank you, Sarah. So regarding America, so if we have a look at uh, the TNFD adopters, for example, we have uh, 47 organizations uh, from America's region. Of course, the distribution is very uneven and the stage where they are is very different, but that's already 12% of uh, the whole list of TNFD adopters. Uh, if, to, if to speak about the policies and the guidance to refer to. I think TNFD has been ma mentioned on multiple occasions during this webinar, and this is probably the most extensive guidance available at the moment. Uh, you can also refer to ESRS reporting requirements if you have branches in the European Union uh, and SBTN, etc. I think I think everything has been mentioned already. Awesome. I think in the spirit of, um, I guess, other other examples and, and thinking more along the lines of policy and legislation in terms of that direction of travel, you know, we've obviously got the EU nature restoration law that was passed um, and accepted. Um, and, and also in the UK in particular, we've got the Environment Act um, and the statutory obligation for measurable biodiversity net gain in the UK as a minimum of 10%. And what that starts to do is, is actually legislate um, a level of expectation for dev and um, for development to reach um, a, a quantifiable metric to measure the value, even though it's using habitat as a proxy for ecological value, it, it's still doing that through a legislative framework. And what that does is start to create a nature market as an aside of that as part of compliance um so already i mean since february um we've got the legal framework here in the uk um to combine nature markets with infrastructure development effectively 
And that is a step in the direction of when you start thinking about natural capital funds, land banking, and, and actually putting a value, a tangible value to, to nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'll ask all of, all of you um, sort of one final question. Um, how, as a sort of support person, how could I help my clients to plan for reporting on biodiversity? Obviously, specifically um, in GRES, but you know, how, where does someone get started? Um, Antonina, I don't know if you want to kick off and then I'll let um, Hinken and Lizzie chime in. Um, yes, sure. So first of all, if you are reporting to GRASP, you are already reporting on biodiversity to some extent with the scope dependent on whether you are undertaking real estate or infrastructure assessment. Uh, we have already a set of questions built in uh, into the assessment in both management and performance sections. Uh, uh, for example, in risk management policies uh, questions, you get to, to choose biodiversity topic uh, as your risk or the area you are working on. On uh, infrastructure side, important to mention is that it is also materiality based and cross materiality for biodiversity, not nature related, but biodiversity uh, specifically is uh, currently location based. Uh, and in terms of where to start, I will repeat what been said before start understanding your interface with nature and starting to understand your dependencies and impacts. And I think I will pass this question uh, to our speakers to give a real world perspective. Yes, in theory. Now tell, tell us about the real world, uh, Hinken and Lizzie, please. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to share anything surprising here. I think the most important thing to do is pull up the TNFD and CSRD metrics. And, and start looking at and how you collect that data. I think it's uh, there's definitely some uplift that you'd need to do, but I think just starting with those metrics mm -hmm. be my first point of call. Yeah, I mean, data, isn't it? it I, I guess the, the, one, the one piece of advice that is probably preventing a lot of, um, you know, corporates and financiers from embarking on actually understanding it is, is because it's too daunting and because data availability um, is probably just not very well understood. And, and I think it's the cliche of not letting perfect be the enemy of good in terms of you don't need to be at the position of, you know, having a full data set for every driver um, to actually make a difference and to actually start putting in some tangible actions because it might be that you have a data black spot in a particular area um, and one of your actions to actually improve on that right mm -hmm. and and to maybe commission a detailed life cycle assessment or or start getting clauses in contracts to mm -hmm. obtain that primary data um, but but ultimately a, a good starting point even if the level of granularity is so high that you've just got a good overview it's enough to hone in some efforts rather than thinking, oh my goodness, there's so much to cover here because let's face it, nature is way more complex than one metric. That is, you know, carbon emissions or, or greenhouse gas emissions. So, so I think, yeah, let's not let perfect be the enemy of good and, and just start somewhere. Life cycle assessments are going to be key. Right, right. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Um, Antonina, I want to close us out. I will say thank you, a big thank you to Lizzie and Hinken. I truly, truly appreciate your time and your uh, intelligence on this complicated topic. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for a very insightful discussion. Uh, but sadly, this brings our to the close us to the close of our webinar. Uh, if you have any questions left, you can uh, reach us at infogress.com. Uh, also, the recording will be available via on-demand link after the webinar. Uh, and follow Gress on LinkedIn and subscribe to our newsletter to learn about the next webinars we're going to have probably on biodiversity as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks all. Bye.